Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is Velen Vanderhorst, your host for the show. First of all, Happy New Year. It's 2020, a new decade. Well, technically, a new decade really starts next year, as you know. But, you know, it's 2020. Like, we can celebrate that. It's I uh, wish you a fun throwback, but looking to the future, roaring 20s. And uh, now I definitely feel old, both by looking at the 2020 Wait But Why post by Tim Urban, which I recommend checking out, and also that I still think that the 20s is referring back to Lovecraftian 1920s, even though we're 100 years later now. So anyhow, I recorded all of this uh, coming up after, well, just before Christmas, 2019. I was hoping to publish again before that, before Christmas, but that was a little bit optimistic. I went out and on vacation. I played games and hung out with uh, with my nieces and with my family, which was awesome. And uh, that takes us now to early 2020. So without further ado, here's me from two weeks ago. I am finally back. It's been months since my last episode. I was just shutting up for a little while because in re-listening and editing to some of the bits I've recorded for this particular podcast episode... I'm recording from my new apartment in Paris, and I realize how much or how easily, I think you can hear them now, probably, uh, police sirens, basically. I'm close to the main, uh, the, the largest police station in Paris Not is not too far away, and uh, one of the main thoroughfares along the River Seine is near my house. And it's kind of, I'm in a very small street, but it makes it, but there's a big square just outside an open space and it makes it kind of a sound funnel. So most of the time it's not very noisy, but if somebody like that car or sometimes people partying on the other side of the square little park here, start yelling on a Friday or Saturday night, their voices carry so much. It's absolutely, I mean, it's kind of impressive, even though I have fairly good windows. Anyhow. So, yeah, the last time I published, I re-listened to the episode again and realized the sound quality was very bad. I apologize for that. I decided to record at the very last minute while I was stranded for an extra day at a hotel. So I didn't use a microphone. I went straight from my laptop and um, and I just was like, I thought, you know what? I just need to publish an update. And now time flew as it does. And I took that time to be settling in. So I talked about the fact that I was organizing a huge birthday bash for my 40th birthday last summer. So that's already in July. So that was two weeks after I recorded that episode on the 5th of July and published it and didn't have much to say. I mean, I was just like talking about my update. So I'm sorry if it wasn't very interesting. I don't know. I'm always quick to judge myself. Um, And it's already been four months. And that was not part of my plan. But Altogether, I, it was a fantastic four months. I've been berating myself for not publishing and recording the podcast, of course. Uh, and at the same time, it's been a fantastic time. So my birthday party was phenomenal. It, it, it felt like a bit of a dream. Uh, I, I spent a long time organizing it. And from what a lot of friends and close friends and family told me, it was absolutely worth it. It was bringing everybody together and it was a magical moment. The whole week from 30 people showing up to two huge villas in Spain between Barcelona and Girona, a little bit closer to Girona in the countryside. So half an hour drive from Girona, an hour and a bit, an hour and 15 minutes from the airport in Barcelona, or an hour and a half in traffic, I think. Um, and we started the week of vacation with about 30-ish people, a little bit more than that with the kids, I think. And then 70 people for my, or I mean, 80 plus for the kids, I think, uh, for my 40th birthday party. Uh, partied all night, and it was... It was just glorious. It was fantastic. You know how difficult it can be to spend time with loved ones, particularly if you've traveled around. And uh, as we get older, and we also have all sorts of different commitments and or budgetary constraints and or we live in different parts of the world. So it was awesome that I had very long term, long date friends, people, some of them I hadn't seen since I was a teenager. Some of them I try to catch up with, but we hadn't hung out all together in a long time. Friends of mine that are of like very close but didn't know each other, uh, family that hadn't been there for that I hadn't seen for a very long time, from my cousin's baby daughter that is one was one year old, well, a year and a half now, to my ninety seven year old grandfather, to friends that were I invited some random friends that well, some of them not particularly close but really just awesome people that said yeah you know what I totally want to come to your birthday in Spain, 
So I had friends come from my brother from Sri Lanka, a friend from Hong Kong, uh, friends from Los Angeles, from Detroit, from um, Texas, uh, from Atlanta, from New York, from London, from Paris, from the south of France, um, where else, from Bordeaux. And it was magical. By the time it was over, it was just, I don't even know what happened and was this real. It felt like a bit of a dream. And I spent the whole day at the house, uh, the whole week, I mean. I just went to do shopping on the first, day, the, the first day after arriving there. We had a rock band at my birthday. They kicked absolute, like, it was phenomenal. My birthday cake with this, this giant yellow smiley face. It was, uh, I, it was fantastic. A lot of people were inspired to go say hi to old friends and family they hadn't seen for a long time, or at least they told me so. Anyway, you know what? A lot of this, and even it's funny because I'm going to be saying this in the the rest of this episode. If you haven't seen or talked to friends of yours in a while, you know, don't wait. You never know. Um, yeah. And moving back to Paris, a lot of the last few months have been a lot about that for me. So... I had geared myself up over the end of the summer for a very difficult apartment search because everybody told me it'd be very difficult. And I was, I don't know, serendipity, extreme luck, the stars and everything in the right place, my mood in the right place, go figure exactly what kind of miracle it was. I don't usually go with the word miracle, but it kind of was. Uh, I found this apartment I'm sitting in on my first day looking. And it is just talking location, location, location. It's extremely, like, ridiculously well located in Paris. Bang on the center. I hesitated thinking, oh, this is not the real Paris. But it is the old Paris. I'm right next to the river. I'm right next to Notre Dame Cathedral. I am right next to a lot of gaming shops and game bars and uh, universities. And it's like the center of the well-meaning champagne caviar intellectual liberal lefty which is kind of like appropriate i guess for me i'm a little bit i can't deny that i'm a bit in that category um i have a beautiful building just sitting across this tiny street i'm on it's a one bedroom i got my stuff arrived from chicago it was furnished but basically so i got a little bit of extra furniture to put my books on i'm pretty much settled I, I am missing a little bit of decoration. I got some tiny Christmas decorations, but I'm going to be going down to the south of France for the rest of the holidays. I don't know when I'm going to manage to publish this. I want to publish it before Christmas, but it might be a bit tight because I'm doing editing from a different perspective. Uh, and then since then, I've been doing a lot of networking. I've been meeting with a lot of people in Paris because I hadn't lived in Paris for 15 years. And I, so most of my career in terms of a communications and brand strategist has been abroad. So I'm, I've been meeting a lot of people. I've been procrastinating things that I've been saying are important. Like I even talked in my last uh, episode about translating my website. It's four months later and I still haven't translated my website. I did, however, get back into role-playing games. I met with a lot of old friends I hadn't seen in a long time, which has been really cool. And um, uh, I had a bit of work come out of Chicago. So uh, I've been busy over the month of November, but now I'm just free and looking for new work. And I've been putting a little bit of effort into... Uh, defining my products and services and putting more work into this idea of playful strategy and explaining more what kind of, what does that look like specifically in a workshop? And uh, at the same time, I've also been, of course, just procrastinating that and not spending enough, like near enough time, or I don't think I've spent enough time on it. But I want to use the podcast to keep developing this because I think I talked about it last time uh, in my last episode about changing some of the, 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 focus for the podcast so less so only pure interviews it doesn't mean i won't have interviews i will but also i want to keep i want to be able to record by myself and i want to be able to keep up some publishing and i want to play games and i want to have playful experiences that inspire and have me give me feed my commenting on what this idea of playful strategy is so that would be different for the podcast rather than straight up interviews and straight up looking at what strategy is because other people are doing that. You can listen to Mark Pollard's podcast. He does that extremely well. He digs really into what strategy is um, and talks to a lot of players within the design, marketing, communications, brand strategy professionals. And it's not that I'm not going to do that. I'm probably still going to be doing that, but I want to keep developing my own thing of one, playing games and 
have playful experiences because I think playful strategy is not only about learning from games. It's a large part of that. So it's been great that I got back into role-playing games. I'm still contributing to the podcast with my friend Julien. And that's where this idea of this particular episode comes from because a couple of months ago, or maybe three already, we recorded a podcast about solo role-playing games in French with another uh, French podcaster, well, YouTuber. Uh, he publishes... Uh, recordings of his games and live sessions of his games and Julien does that as well Sam Sam Zitterman and uh so I learned about the idea of solo role-playing games that are different from choose your own adventure books and they're a set of kind of niche I guess games for rules about solo role-playing games and I found one I thought oh well I should try that so that I can play myself I've had some conversations with people over the last few months who are like wow you have interesting things to say. You should just record yourself to saying them in the podcast. And I usually think that that's not enough. Myself speaking of my own opinions is not sufficient for the podcast. And I tend to think that what I have to say, other people can say it a lot better and smarter and all that. Um, and it's true. There's millions of things you could be listening to on other podcasts. There are people that are smarter than me. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't have interesting things to say. But I usually think I need some kind of wrapper uh, to, and the wrapper is going to be like, what is what is informing playful strategies? And so I've recorded myself playing a game, a solo role playing game called Quill, and that's what this episode is going to be about. And I'm going to experiment. I'm experimenting with a different kind of editing because I'm going to play and comment and then weave it all together, hopefully in not too clunky a way. And uh, you'll be able to tell me if you think it's interesting and like what you think of it and if you think it works well or not and if you want to participate because one of the reasons i've been trying to get a group of people to play a role-playing game but that's very difficult to coordinate from a from a schedule perspective so it's still a goal so if you want to play get in touch with me so and uh give me a review because that gets more people to listen to the podcast even though it doesn't have tons of credibility because I'm, but i'm getting back into posting so i'll, I'll regain my credibility and and I have nowhere else to go. I'm back home in Paris, even though I'll, I'll talk more about Paris some other time. That's enough rambling for now. So uh, just a bit of a gist on, don't forget, you can find me if you're looking for anything from a brand strategy perspective. You want to find out more about playful strategy workshops. Uh, you can contact me at villum at icecreamforeveryone.net. That's W-I-L-L-E-M at icecreamforeveryone.net. That's the main website. You can find all my stuff. You can contact me on Twitter. Uh, that's I C Villem on Twitter, letters I, letter C W I L L E M. You can find the ice cream for everyone page on Facebook. And, um, yeah, I think that's about it right now. But the main idea is I know it's very, it takes time, but if you go onto your favorite podcasting app and give us a five star review or give me a five star review, that helps other people find the podcast. And reach out to me if you want to play a game. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this particular episode. And uh, without further ado, that's already enough rambling. And I said that tw twice. Um, that's me coming up, playing Quill and commenting on it. So quickly, for the concept of a role-playing game, if you're not familiar with this, a tabletop role-playing game, and this is what I've been talking about, it's typically you gather around a table with friends of yours and it's a collaborative storytelling game. Typically one person is the game master or the dungeon master and it's kind of the arbiter and the narrator of the game and everybody else incarnates a character within the world that they're all just storytelling together. And uh, discover the existence of solo role-playing games that are different from fantasy, fighting fantasy um, choose-your-own-adventure type books. So this goes a step further into imagining, and there's a lot of different kinds of a more quote-unquote experimental, which doesn't really matter because for a lot of people who, like, who are not familiar with role-playing games at all, all of this is going to be completely experimental. And I looked at a few um, of these solo role-playing games and I came across one that was awarded and I thought was kind of interesting uh, or was interesting. I thought I came across this game that is interesting, quite simply. And that I played a few days ago, but that the recording didn't play out, didn't work out correctly at all. So I'll see what I use from the recording of the first session, and I'm gonna about to record myself to play again. So um, we're gonna play a game called Quill, or I'm gonna play and you're gonna listen, I guess. 
uh, and I think I was just like really interested in the in the premise of the game. So I mean, more, number one, I was intrigued by playing a solo role playing game, and I have several friends, so Julien and uh, a, another guest, Samuel Ziederman, who recorded themselves. And I think there's a lot of other people, and there might be people recording themselves talking about this game I'm about to play. I didn't look at that yet online, just because I I wanted to play without having the influence of other people playing it. Uh, and just like reading the rules, getting the PDF, it comes in the form of a PDF. It's called Quill, and Quill is a letter-writing role-playing game for a single player, designed by Scott Malthouse. And uh, it's just, he re published it last year, apparently it won a, an independent indie RPG award. And I think it's just a very interesting experience to play a character writing a letter in a fictional world, world with some rules instructing how it all works um and apparently he's got and i I'm, i'll get i'll reach out to scott who designed the game and uh, find out about maybe having a conversation with him but also because i just want to publish things for the podcast rather than wait to schedule conversations um i'm probably gonna publish this myself and um yeah that's getting us into like intro stuff that i'll come back to so uh, it became a platinum sell on Draw Through RPG, which is a popular, if not the most popular, role playing game online role playing game portal to buy a role playing game like book p slash text PDF documents. And uh, they had um, this designer had a lot of praise from teachers and colleges and high school who are using Quill as a teaching aid, which is kind of interesting. So, what is it? Quill is a role playing game for a single player. In this case, me. Could be you, if you're listening to this. I will be taking on the role of a person writing a letter, a letter writer, that for whatever reason, the reason given is uh, in different scenarios, is writing a letter to a recipient. So, and I have attributes as my character has attributes, and uh, it's going to have, there's three types of attributes. One is penmanship, which is the quality of my writing, whether there's ink blots, whether I'm making a mess of it, whether I'm like scratching things. Uh, the language, so quality of language, and heart, whether I'm able to add a lot of emotion to the letter. And each one of the characters that you can choose has higher or lower skill in the different areas. And uh, so in a typical game, um, and there's like mechanics that govern the way that the game and the letter is being written. And then basically you're scoring points in the way that you're writing the letter to try to have a favorable answer to the letter you're writing from the, the recipient of the letter, essentially. What do you need to play? So I have paper in front of me. I have a letter writing pad, my, uh, that one. Uh, I have my whole bag of dice. So you need to be able to play three six-sided die, D6, which is you know, your normal cubic die, because a cube die has six faces, but there's a lot of other kinds of dice that are used uh, typically in role-playing games. But it's when we got three of those. And uh, we're going to choose a character. And the idea is the setting of Quill, the Quillia. It's a, the, it's a quasi-medieval land with some light fantasy elements. A green and pleasant land with high kings reign over the peasantry, monks toll the monastery bells, and knights ride into battle on the emerald fields. While the, set the setting is in detail in these rules, I guess you could change the setting if you want, it's likely you can conjure this image fairly easily in your imagination. So like some pretty fairly medieval, when they say light fantasy, it's usually, you know, there might be some magical aspects, but not dragons and orcs and elves at every turn. So the Lord of the Rings is high fantasy. Game of Thrones at the beginning is kind of light fantasy, but then it gets to, to what's usually called dark and gritty fantasy. And I think, I haven't watched the latest seasons of Game of Thrones, but towards the end, there's a lot of, you know, the um, I can't, the White Walkers. I was going to say the ice zombies. Um, anyhow, light fantasy, kind of like King Arthur type thing, I guess. All right, so, and you have these characters. So you choose the character, and you go into the characters as different skill sets and um, with like so there's three attributes as i said penmanship language and heart and each one of the characters has like poor which is one die one i get one die to roll average two dice to roll and good is three dice to roll you have the monk the knight 
the poet, the aristocrat, the scholar, and the courtier. Uh, and then you get a special skill that you can use, basically gives you one plus die at a roll while you're writing your letter. All right, and then we can get into the rules of the game. So we're going to choose one of the characters. So last time I played, I was hesitating and talked about uh, choosing between the aristocrat and the monk. I chose the monk uh, the last time I played and wrote a letter is essentially what I did when I was playing. And um, uh, I'm hesitating to play the same thing or something different. Okay, so now I know the rules because I played already once and I was just looking at the knights. Let me read through the description of the knight. It's, it's quite a short game. I mean, there's 33 pages and it's it's very quickly read, right? It's, an, it's a very interesting conceit and experience to get people into it and to find gaming elements around, but let's go into that. So the knight. The knight is the bastion of chivalry and romance. romance. Tales are told of great knights and their bravery in the battlefield. Knights embark on great quests, grand quests, often given by the king or queen, whether it is to save a village from martyrs or to rid a forest from barbarians, It's worth noting that knights can either be men or women. While knights write with all their heart, they do not have the best grasp of language. So they have average penmanship, meaning two dice, uh, poor language, uh, one dice, and good heart, meaning three dice. So because I know the rules, I think I understand now that the stats, the attributes of the knight are a little bit tricky in the way that you score points. So they feel like a little bit more of a gamble. So I'm going to choose this time based on that it seems to be a little bit more of a challenge to be playing with a knight than any other character. So I played with the monk last time and actually the penmanship has, the, the monk has strong penmanship because the idea is like they train and they write manuscripts so they very they have very clean writing. Um, yeah, all right, I'll go with the knight. I'll be a knight. Why not? I'll be a knight. Sir, let's pick a name for this knight. Sir Gallandel the Fairfooted. So I'm doing this for the first time, so this is a little bit experimental, both in the way that I'm playing a game and I'm solo playing a role-playing game, and I'm re-listening to myself play, and I'm stopping the recording with some notes and some comments I have about myself, and I'm not sure how I'm going to edit this. So I'm not even sure I'm going to be, you know, publishing what I'm just saying right now. Anyhow, about naming a role-playing game character. Uh, one of the things that I thought would be great to have a little bit more and maybe it doesn't need tons more in this particular game of quill particularly if i guess teachers are using it or other people who might be using it in a solo perspective i mean it is a pretty niche game so presumably you already know about role-playing games but you never know you might come around because somebody told you about solo role-playing games like i heard about it and i went down to itch.io um because itch.io or itch.io i'm not sure how it's pronounced uh, it's an independent role-playing game, well, gaming platform. Sorry, it started with video games, but there's role-playing games and other types of games that are published on the platform. So you can go to Drive Through RPG that I mentioned and I may have published in this episode, or itch.io, itch.io, and that's where I found Quill. And um, so we have a description of the different characters, but there's not that much flavor or text to help you get into the character that you're playing or that you're writing a letter for. And, um, I mean, I like the side of interpreting characters when I'm playing a role-playing game. So just naming him, like Sir Gallandel the Fairfooted, or Brother Nigel, I, I believe my monk was, if I publish part, bits of that as well. Um, even just naming them, there's no instructions in the game to be naming your character or to be thinking about uh, what, who you are as a person. So, and I like that. And it might help to give a little bit more flavor to the letter, whether that's questions, whether that's, uh, it could have been something to add a qualifier to the different attributes. So for example, if you have poor letter, there could be a little bit of a question or a prompt to help you give some flavor and some depth to the character that you play. All right, so let's get into the rules. So Sir Gallandell, the fair 
and you get to choose a skill. Uh, so the skill gives you a plus one at one of the things. So, uh, all right, as I said, I get penmanship average, so that means two days. Language poor, which is like not very good with language. It's bad because it's like that, that's points. And heart, I'm good at heart. But a lot of strong emotions going on. So once per scenario, which is basically once per game, once per letter, which I, I played last time. And I mean, you could take a lot longer or shorter, I guess. I took about, what, 45 minutes to an hour, maybe, to play through that game. And I, and I, I didn't try to write a beautiful letter. I mean, I tried to like play, understand how the game worked. And I'm probably going to do something similar this time. So you have inspiration, illumination, or augmentation. So you get plus one dice at one of your rolls. Basically, because there's three of them, my main choice is to, do I pick a skill that's going to allow me to alleviate one of my uh, weakness, my main weakness for one of the throat, one of the rolls of the game? Or do I get something that's average to make it a little bit better? Or do I take my strongest skill in heart and make it even better? Which, so far as I've seen from the game and the rolls you have to make, I'm not sure that's a very good idea. No, I don't know. All right, so there's there's different ways to go about this, and a role-playing game is kind of like this as well. So I could go by the way of imagining who my character is and giving my character attributes and a personality and personality traits, or, which is the other idea, like optimizing, and it's kind of like role-playing game jargon, to try to understand how the rules work and try to optimize based on the mechanics, the mechanisms of the game, rather than the role you're portraying which that it's just it's just different ways to look at the game it's, it, there's no necessarily right or wrong but in my case of a knight you know what i will use the even though it is the thing that is alleviating one of my my, my main weakness which is the quality of my language inspiration skills you say you're a born leader with the ability to use powerful language to inspire others in your letters i just like the idea of my knight being a born leader so i'll, I'll go with that one which I kind of did the same thing last time, which was just to pick the skill that was uh, trying to alleviate my weakness rather than strengthen a strength, if you will. So that means that once per game, at whatever, for whatever role I pick, uh, out of five, essentially, because there's five paragraphs, so I'll, I'll get into that when I go into the rules, I get to add one dice to my language role, essentially. And it's kind of very meta commenting on my own uh, playing the game. One of the things I like about role playing games, and I might have said that in other episodes, but it might be a little bit clearer now that I'm actually portraying and giving you an example for the first time what that means, is um, thinking about and incarnating characters. Because after all, a lot of the job in terms of uh, strategy it, traditionally within a advertising communication marketing environment is to be thinking about who is on the receiving end of the communication and message like who are we trying to convince of what to sell what product for example a product if we take that as an example so that involves a lot of imagining demographics imagining the people who are going to be buying this toothpaste radio product financial credit card whatever whatever it is um or it could be internal as well. It could be from a business perspective. So putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else and not only putting yourself in the shoes of somebody else, but thinking about both one person at a time and millions of people that are representing and that are often very different from who you are. I mean, like, you know, my job has led me to think about, all right, well, what do all the women in India think about this and what kind of shampoo are they looking for? Uh, and I'm both far from India overall and from women altogether as well. So playing role-playing games and thinking about a character, yes, it's fiction, but it got me interested in you know, what does it mean to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else? Uh, how can I find out more about that somebody else to be able to better, to have a better sense of putting myself in their shoes, essentially? So the rules. So the way you play a game of Quilt uh, I'm taking pause with drinking tea at the same time because they say, like, take one of your... It's one of the setups of the game. Like, you know, sit down in a quiet and comfortable condo. And so I'm in my apartment in Paris at my desk. And uh, so you roll up attributes. So you're writing a letter and you have to make rolls while you're writing the letter. 
and you have to write five paragraphs. And in each paragraph, you have to add a word or set of words that are part of a group of words that is called the ink pot that is part of your scenario. And there's a combination. So that makes it that you have to pick the word that you're going to add that is going to be appropriate to the story that you're writing based on the scenario, which gives you like who you're writing to, why. And uh, you're, you have to write a language rule to see if you can use the better or the lesser word. You can choose to set a flourish, which is adding heart to your uh, to your letter, but that runs a risk of either doubling or diminishing the amount of points that are available. So that's why it's, I mean, you'll see what I mean by that in terms of choosing the knight. It's kind of the knight is a little bit more risky, it seems like. And then at the end of each paragraph, you have to roll a dice to see if you, you, know, you didn't make a mess of things when you're writing with your... Uh, fancy ink set and if you didn't like write a whole blotch and make it kind of dirty so what you write in the paragraph is the creative bit okay so you have an intention you have a reason why you're writing who you're writing to you have to write five paragraphs you have a set of words that you're using for each one of the paragraphs that allows you to accomplish what you're writing and you can build around for the rest there's also rules of correspondence, which each scenario has. So, and then you score points based on the different rules that you make. And then if you score less than five points, it's unsuccessful, five to seven points. I mean, there's, and then you, there's like, you count the amount of points that you've made at the end. And I'm going to put paragraph one. Okay. All right. So now I have to choose a scenario. All right, so I am the knight, Sir Gallandell the Fairfooted, and I could be. It's a letter to an archduke that you write to send condolences. A letter to an art dealer, worried that this painting might be a fake. A letter to condolences again. Pretty much no, informing a father of their son's death is pretty dark and a letter to a tyrant king about thinking that you've seen some kind of suspicious dude that is a spy and it's kind of cute there's i mean i say this 33 pages there's a lot of pages that are blind pages of letter parchment that you can just print i don't really know why there's five of them it's kind of a I guess if it's in printed format, you can write directly in it, but it, it seems more logical to make copies of it, but I don't know. Maybe I'm... Anyway. All right. Uh, I did the king last time, so I can choose another one. Okay. I'm going to change from the last time, I guess, because I, I wrote the letter to the tyrant king. I'm going to go with the first one, quite simply. And uh, that's to the Archduke. So I'm writing a letter to the Archduke Godfrey a powerful member of the royal family who is known for a very serious demeanor. I am writing to give my condolences for the passing of his sister, Mary of Linchester. She came down with a consumption and passed away a week ago. I was acquainted with her, having been in the same school when we were young. I'll bring up our pasts and what we both did when we were children. Okay. Rules of correspondence, courtiers, courtiers and aristocrats gain an extra heart die in this scenario. I'm not those things, so I don't get that. Uh, and I am using superior parchment, so I gain an extra penmanship die. Why not? So that gives me two. So that gives me like three dice in penmanship and in heart. And uh, I still have my one in language, which is kind of not great. All right. So, and then I have the ink pot. So you have one, two, three, four, five. So you have 10 sets of two words and you have to use five out of the ten basically and those ink pots the words are stuff that is going to allow me to talk about the past i had with her the daughter um or sister rather the archduke's sister sorry and uh, my to write my condolences and the idea is i have to the structure is i have to think about what i'm going to write pick one set of two things with a lesser and a better word and then choose if I'm going to write a flourish. So that means I get to write a, an adjective to improve the word. But this mostly mechanically means I write, I 
roll my heart dice. And if I succeed, that gets me an extra point in language. But then I have to roll a language die to see if I get to write the better word or the lesser word, quote unquote. Uh, that's the way they're organized. So what I mean by that is, so, you know, you could choose one word that is either church, which is the lesser word, or the cathedral of light, which is the better word. Uh, teachers, lesser words, scholars, higher word. And that is based on whether I succeed a roll. So succeeding a roll means I roll a five or a six on one of the dice, quite simply. So you see it's, it's just, so the rolls are decided. I and mean, when I finish writing a paragraph, I roll the dice for penmanship. If I succeed that, I get one point. If I roll language, I get a point for a uh, higher language. But let me just double check the flourish rules. Flourish, flourish, flourish. Flourishes. So you can add an adverb or an adjective describing, descriptive, to enhance the word you, stool, or you choose. So stallion could be white stallion, okay? To augment, you have to choose to make a heart test. So for example, the last one, I, I went with a monk who do, only has one dice in heart, so I didn't necessarily augment all the time. Actually, generally, I didn't. Um, before you roll your language dice. To do so, roll it out. Okay, cool. So if it is augmented, you score two points. But if the word is an inferior word, you don't score any points. So meaning if I succeed, so if I fail my, oh, wait, no. no, this sucks. So this is what might happen to me, basically. So you roll the heart. You'll see. You'll, you'll get to see while I'm playing. Sorry, I'm just like trying to figure out the thing. I'm explaining too much. Let me let me play. So playing means I'm going to just like shut up and write for a little while. And then I'll write to you. If there's any interesting musings, I'll see if I include them or not. So, uh, the passing of Mario Linchester, who died, came down with consumption. We were in the same school. Bring up the past and sh give my condolences. So, let's start with Dear Archduke Godfrey. And I'm not sure what the right title for an Archduke is. I'm just going to go with Dear Archduke. I'm not entirely sure. Dear Archduke. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really write condolences letters. This is a very interesting one. I mean, I haven't before. This is, I think this is the first time I write a letter of condolences. I mean, I've had close ones die, but if, if they were so close, I didn't even have to write like a distant letter to somebody I didn't know all that well. But it seems in good form to talk a little bit about who I am in the past before saying my condolences, like jumping straight into the condolences. So perhaps, yeah, let's try to mention the past before, like when we start. So I'll go with the Church Cathedral of Light. And I mean, because I have three dice, it makes sense to roll for a flourish first. So I'll roll my first dice. And I have one, six, three, four. So one, six is success. So I get to do a flourish. And then I do my language, which was only a one. If I fail that, I'm going to lose points to begin with, which is like, kind of sucks. But. And a six. I succeed. All right. So I get two points for the flourish, one point for language, and I can use a cathedral of light rather than church as the idea, and a, add an adjective. It is funny to hear myself writing a letter and commenting on I haven't written any letters of condolences. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking you haven't written any, maybe, I mean, maybe you have written letters. Have you written a letter at all is the question. When's the last time you wrote a letter to somebody that you know? The last time I did was to my niece earlier this year, actually. We exchanged a couple of letters, and I think I should do that again. So I, I just recently sent her a card and a package for her birthday, and I'm going to see her at Christmas. And... um but yeah, just like saying, it's kind of weird that I haven't written, well, I haven't written a letter to an archduke, that's kind of normal. And I haven't written, written a letter of condolences, fortunately. But before I have to send messages of condolences, rather than that, what if I just actually take a pen and paper and write a letter to somebody I love? If you don't have time for pen and paper, a postcard is still actually really nice. Uh, I send postcards to my nieces and to friends when I go traveling and when I go on holidays as much as I can. It's, uh, you know, it feels kind of quaint today, but it is really nice to get a postcard and to get a letter. 
And it is a nice exercise to stop and think about what you're writing and to go past, like, I don't know what I want to tell this person aside from just, you know, send them a message of well wishes and of love and appreciation. But otherwise, you're just talking about your life. And I guess it's a little bit of what I do on the podcast as well. Um, sort of. Anyway, write a letter. Okay. So I have my first paragraph. You know, wow. Well, this is kind of quickly written. I mean, I, I think it could do better. But anyway. Dear Archduke Duke. Godfrey, I am Sir Gallandale the Fairfooted, and I had the privilege of getting to know your sister, Mary Lutister, as we were children, or as children. We both attended the glorious school of the Cathedral of Light near Lingister. I hold such fond memories of that time that I wish to share them with you. And now I roll dice on my penmanship, so I have three dice to roll for this. And uh, if I succeed, I get basically an extra point. And I roll three threes, which is not a five or a six. So I don't get any points for that. So no points for penmanship of the first paragraph. It gives me a total of three, which is really good. And I can move on to the next paragraph. Talking about penmanship, that reminds me, my penmanship is horrible. It's just disgusting. Uh, it's very ugly and it got only worse since I've been typing on a machine. And But I remember I learned with a fountain pen in primary school and I'm left-handed. So I'm left-handed, but I hold, I know some left-handed people hold their pen like the other way around, like your hand is above the pen so that you have a bit of space behind what you're writing. But I carry it the normal way. I, you, I mean, I hold my pen in the, the same way a right-hand person would be holding it. So basically, my fingers trail behind the fresh ink. So I would blotch and like put, there would be stains and all sorts of mess with my fountain pen. It was like all over the place. Absolutely gross. I mean, I, I that's the reason I used to ballpoint, ballpoint pen pretty quickly and I never kept the fountain pen. I did listen to a conversation uh, of one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman, talk about geek out about fountain pens uh really good interview with tim ferris i recommend it because neil gaiman is not on a lot of i mean he's there's a lot of talks that are amazing you can find of him and his um uh his collection of non-fiction the view from the cheap seats is fantastic but anyway yeah if you want to geek out about fountain pens and find out and hear where the best places are what kind of brand you should get into to start getting back into fountain pens if you want to be writing it's an interview I recommend. I don't know how well I knew this woman. I guess I don't know unless she mentioned her death or passing. All right, I'm rolling heart because I should. And I have a five, so it means it's a success for my flourish. And then I'm going to use my inspiration to get plus one for my language. I get a six, that's a success. All right, so a quick one. Uh, I'm saddened to have heard of her sudden and tragic passing. I wish to convey my condolences to you and the whole family from the bottom of my heart. So another penmanship roll. See, like that was well written. And a five, so I get an extra point for that. Paragraph three. So I'm good on the point side of things right now, but I think I'm pretty much going to roll heart every time, which is a gamble because then it's followed by one die, and uh, the, I, basically, the point is I'm, I'm going to lose points sooner rather than later. I mean, it might not even be the next paragraph where we're going to go into talk about... Should we talk about uh, ducks and mallards for some reason? It's feeding ducks. So about rolling that extra die, and I suspected and mentioned it about choosing the knight as a character, that there would be a measure of a little bit of gambling, and I mentioned that. Um, so rolling the dice and adding flourish in this game is a bit of a gamble because you might lose points. And it was even more so when I had like three dice to throw for a flourish, but only one to follow. And I needed both success to be successful. Otherwise, I would lose points. If the first one is more successful and obviously probabilities uh, say that it's more likely that I'm going to be losing a point given have three dice to throw and then one dice to throw. Hence the gamble. Uh, in the case of a, usually that kind of mechanism, if it's a board game, is called a push your luck, which makes sense because, well, it's not exactly push your luck. I mean, that would be a little bit different, but it feels like that because it's like, well, I could double my points, but I might lose one and I have three dice to throw and then one dice to throw. 
uh, it's an interesting one. And I just wanted to mention here that in terms of doing developing strategies for a client and adding play and playful elements to a strategy, well, games usually have uh, elements of randomness. And adding luck, gambling, and randomness to a strategy doesn't feel like, well, a very good strategy. Obviously, an like a purely strategy, abstract strategy game like chess doesn't have any randomness at all. Um, so adding something that is very obviously like that, elements of randomness, I, I think, are generally should be considered quite sparse or very parsimoniously sprinkled on something that I would consider to be playful strategy because it has to be first and foremost strategy. However, throwing dice and taking a bit of risk, having a bit of a gamble can be fun. And adding a little bit of fun adds and I think fosters the kind of creativity that I think I like out of this idea of playful strategy. It just needs to be considered exactly you know, how much or how little you want and like throwing three dice and throwing one without much associated to the role that you're playing and to the actual success of the recipient of the letter is missing out a little bit. So that's something that's interesting to play in terms of the game of Quill, not something I would take away so much in something I would add for a, for a, a strategy, essentially, for developing a workshop for a client or developing a new brand. Um, yeah, that's something I'm, I mean, basically my main point is gambling, pushing your luck, throwing dice is something and elements of randomness or increased elements of randomness is something I'm quite wary of when I talk about playful strategy. So we're going to go with the ducks and mallards. Ducks, mallards is better. No, we love to, anyway, heart first, three dice and I fail. So that's interesting. Uh, so we can... Okay, so it's it's actually better to fail my heart roll than to succeed and then fail my language roll. It's kind of works. Kind of works. All right, language roll. I get one and I fail, so I have to use the word ducks, which is not a point. I don't get points for that. No points. No points. At least I don't lose points because I could have lost points. You think because of the mechanics of like dice led like this, I get put a little bit less effort perhaps in what I'm writing and like am I really interpreting the role of this knight very well uh, I don't know it's difficult short paragraph she was such a kind and general soul so she was such a kind and general soul she always gave alms and charitable donations to the less fortunate and fed the dunks in the ponds which gets me no points so I have no five or six those three dice so that's a zero point paragraph it's not very inspired there i guess all right what am i using next that i've not used yet in terms of the word i have it in the ink pot okay so the options are climbing trees or scaling oaks i'm going to try to flourish that it's going to be interesting all right my flourish is successful i got a five and a six now i got one die following that and if i fail that I have to use the lesser word and lose a point. And I fail. All right, so I fail my language role, meaning I have to use climbing trees, and I'm gonna use a flourish, and it's not gonna sound good, meaning it's a clunky style, and I lose one point, which is no good. Yeah, I don't know who this woman is, but it's kind of weird that I'm talking about climbing trees. I kind of have a bad feeling about the point of this letter. I'm not sure I'm very inspired, but just testing the game. We spent one afternoon daringly climbing trees in the orchard to pick the juiciest apples. We've had such fun playing together. Penmanship roll. Come on, give me one point at least, or at least a zero, because I have a minus point. Oh, no, 442. That's bad. Zero. So that's a, a minus one paragraph. It's no good. And my last paragraph. Let's talk about the angels and stuff. And might as well, I'm going to enhance it, and I succeed at that roll because I got three dice, and now the following one, I have one, and I have to roll a five or a six, and I fail with a two, so that means I'm also going to, I'm going to lose points, <laughs> another minus one, and I can only hope for a zero, which is just poor. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, not looking very good for this letter, I'll tell you guys. It was 
pretty bad letter in terms of the game. I mean, it's not a very nice letter to begin with in terms of anything. The point I'm thinking about commenting on whether this is a nice letter or not, something to add as well. I mean, something that could have been nice just in the, in the game itself would be rules of writing. Or, or not rules necessarily, but guidelines, what makes a good letter, what makes good literature. It doesn't need to be long, but it is also interesting, I think. Um, yeah, anyway, just a small point. I think it would be interesting to have a little bit more. And it makes me curious in writing the letter. Oh, okay, well, what makes a good letter? I have a sense of that, but I don't even remember from school how I know that. But I don't know that in this in the setting of a, you know, the heroic, light, medieval fantasy setting of uh, the game of Quill, for example. And it also makes you think that you could easily transpose that letter writing to another time period, 19th century. Uh, you, you know, well, the Call of Cthulhu and Lovecraftian horror is very popular in uh, role-playing games. So you could imagine 19th century New England, Providence, Rhode Island, writing a letter in the scenario of Lovecraftian horror. And like, how, what would be the guidelines for writing that kind of letter? That would be interesting as well. All right, so I get to roll three dice to finish and get my, well, that's my pension, penmanship roll. And I succeeded that one, so I cancel out the minus one at least. It's one, so it's zero paragraph, zero paragraph, so it's like seven. Minus one is six total for the letter, which is not very good. <laughs> it's a six-point letter. The Archduke responds kindly, but is quick to criticize your letter. You will unlikely hear from him for some month. Which is not very surprising, because overall the letter reads, Dear Archduke Godfrey, I am Sir Gallandale the Fairfooted, and I had the privilege of getting to know your sister, Mary of Linchester, as of children. We both attended the glorious school of the Cathedral of Light near Linchester. I hold such fond memories of that time that I wish to share them with you. I am saddened to have heard of her sudden and tragic passing. Maybe I should have put that first. Anyway, I wish to convey my condolences to you and the whole family from the bottom of my heart. She was such a kind and generous soul, she always gave alms, gave alms and charitable donations to the less fortunate and fed the ducks in the ponds, which makes no sense, but it doesn't matter. We spent one afternoon daringly climbing trees in the orchard. That doesn't make sense either. To pick the juiciest apples, we had such fun playing together. Yeah, no wonder he didn't reply. It's not particularly appropriate. I am sure the angels of heaven welcomed her with open arms and celebrated her blessed life. She will be living eternally blissful in the afterlife. That's repetitive and redundant. My sincere condolences... Sure, Gallandell, the fair-footed. Yeah, so uh, that's Quill. So it is a funny game. It's very interesting to... It's an interesting experience. It's very weird to have a structure to be writing a letter like this. But it's a cool exercise. Uh, but hot off the press, and this is similar to what I said the other day, even though my letter is not very good, to be honest, but I hope I can still pick some stuff from my previous letter because it was not amazing, but it was a little bit better than this. It does get you into it. It gives you a gaming, kind of those dice and the structure. It's certainly an activity to be practicing some wordsmithing by yourself. And I think there's something very interesting in terms of the exercises I could be using from a strategy standpoint, given how I usually get to, I mean, I usually, one of the things is you do as a strategist is write a brief for the creative team. And I think there's something very interesting in picking words and seeing how they can fit within a letter and taking the role of some somebody writing a letter, trying to convey a particular message. Uh, now, on the other hand, what I find a little bit, uh, something that's a little bit missing from this is that you could, the, 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 me the mechanisms of rolling those dice and using those words and scoring points is not directly related to really the quality of the letter, whether you are playing to your role or not, whether you're adding words that would make sense for a knight or for a monk or for a poet to be saying in the context of the scenario. Now, how, how you would do that playing solo, because that's the other thing is like to be able to have rules of playing solo, you need to have something that I guess is a little bit of an arbiter. And I don't have any experience in solo role playing games. So this is one of the first times I'm playing. The constraint of using word constraint of using words in the ink pot is very interesting from a creative perspective. But the fact that the words and what you how you use them 
is very detached to how many points you score because it's just like going to be based on whether you succeed in rolling your dice makes it that it doesn't really it doesn't feel like it really matters to be adding a lot of thought to be creative in the letter so i would look at i'm curious to say all right well how could you make that experience or how could you use that experience to enhance and encourage creativity rather than feel like well it doesn't really my creativity doesn't matter because it only matters if i roll a five or a six uh so that's that's a bit uh, it feels like a bit of a missed opportunity but and th at the same time i really like that it gets people into writing and i can totally see how teachers could use that to get uh children to be encouraged to write having a more playful environment that you're playing a character that there's dice to roll and that you can compare letters with other students or other classmates to see if you have a successful letter or not. And it is very easy to be creating characters or creating scenarios. It doesn't take a lot. You can easily, there's 10 sets of words in the ink pot. You can easily add a lot more for sure. Uh, and I think it also is very good in terms of beginning conversations on in beginning conversations in terms of what a flourish is. So adding adjectives and adverbs to transform, enhance, describe, uh, add descriptors to a situation in written form. Uh, it opens up the conversation from an education standpoint of what might be a uh, synonym, so what might be lesser or better vocabulary to be used in different circumstances. But it also, but that's also interesting because in a class setting, then it's no longer a solo role playing game, because if you have a teacher giving you the assignment, you have a person that is giving a lot more context around their letter writing so but i can definitely see how it could lend itself to that experience the other thing i'm thinking about from a strategy perspective um and i hope this makes sense if you don't work in strategy you don't work in communications i hope those comments about strategy are still useful to you this is just like different thoughts about the game and how the different bits of the game could be used in different environments, uh, which might be relevant to you or not. So I know that a lot of people playing games listen to this. I know that a lot of people that work into work in advertising, marketing, strategy, uh, listen to the podcast. So people who play games might be thinking about different mechanisms and where they can be applied. And, you know, there might be being opportunities to apply those in different circumstances. So... I'm thinking about the ink pot and the idea of using specific words in writing in a specific situation. So I know that there are other exercises that I have used, uh, and I think this kind of exercise might exist as well in, in a different form. Anyway, I've used exercises that are discussing a workshop to look at your branding and positioning, like what is your business and what is your brand about, which could be personal branding or business branding as well. So you usually end up with a set of words or adjectives to express what your values are. And you could be doing this personally or in the name of a business. And I think it's an interesting point to say, oh, well, well, what if you use those five words in an email or a letter, which could be ending up to be like something like a mission statement. Uh, that's one of the forms it usually takes. But it is also interesting to say, oh, what if I am writing that as an email or as a letter to express my own values as a brand, whether it's my business's brand, uh, whether it's my brand like the business I work for, uh, or myself, personal branding. So I think that, that that's one exercise that I may well be taking away from a playful strategy standpoint and where I could take the idea of the ink pot. I'd probably leave aside the better, the idea of the better or lesser. Better or lesser is my vocabulary, by the way. The game says something else. I can't remember what it is. It talks about um, superior words. There you go. Inferior and superior words. So better and lesser, it's pretty much the same. Okay. All right. Well, listen, this was a really enjoyable experience to record, listen to myself, add a few more comments on top. And I definitely want to be doing more of this. I hope you enjoyed listening. Uh, I don't know how it was. I would really love some feedback on this particular format because I think, I, I mean, I'm wanting to, obviously, if I publish this, I'm wanting to direct the podcast in this direction of practicing playful experiences and commenting on them. And I'm going to start by myself. But if you want to join me, 
on playing games, having playful experiences together at various times, uh, please get in touch. It's going to be easier from a time difference perspective to be with people in Europe, but I definitely want to keep talking with people from all over. So if you want to, if you have ideas, if you want to join me for an episode, uh, don't hesitate. Please give me feedback or put a review on uh, your favorite podcasting app. You can reach me by email. That's at villem, W-I-L-L-E-M, at icecreamforeveryone.net. Uh, that's Ice Cream for Everyone, everything attached. You can find all the contents on the website at icecreamforeveryone.net. You can like send me a message on Twitter. That's letters I and C, uh, Villem, W-I-L-L-E-M, Ice Cream Villem, if you will, I C Villem. But I think that's about it for now. So thank you very much for listening once again. Uh, good afternoon, morning, night, whatever time of day or night it is for you. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.